get more on inflation, on the economy, maybe bond yields, and the Fed Chair Powell's testimony today. Joining us, one of our friends, and that is Paul McCulley, Stanton, Virginia's own, oh, former PIMCO chief economist, senior fellow now at Cornell University. Paul, perfect day to have you on, because you know all, all the stuff Karen just said she was confused by. You're probably not. Explain to us how we should view inflation, because you know what? Used car prices are soaring. Do I need to worry about that in three months? Or what's the real inflation worry? I think that Chair Powell did a great job of explaining the dynamics today in that we've got a unique experience of reopening the economy after a medically induced coma. And the demand side is coming on much faster and much stronger than the supply side. That is what's going on. The demand side is stronger than horseradish and the supply side has got to catch up. And what Jay was communicating today is he believes in a dynamic U.S. economy and that the supply side will adjust in part related to the huge profit opportunities associated with the elevated pricing and this will sort itself out. Therefore, he looks at the inflationary pressures as temporary. Yeah. And he believes that firmly. At the same time, he's also humble in that there are a lot of things that we don't know about this economy post-pandemic. So he has a base case scenario, and then he is in risk management mode. And the most interesting thing he yeah. said today to me is this is going to be transitory one way or the other, either organically, because the supply side adjusts uh, in a nice, efficient way, or six months out or so, they'll have to lean against the demand side of the economy. So it's going to be transitory. It's just a matter of whether or not it's going to be the easy way or the hard way. Well, everything's transitory. It's like Stephen Wright once said, the comedian, everything's within walking distance if you have the time. But, I mean, this is a dangerous game in a way that Powell is playing, Paul, because, and by the way, your condiment puns need work. They don't cut the mustard. Let's talk about this. You watch the Tour de France. I watch it almost every day, by the way, NBC Sports. And there's always this guy that goes for a breakaway, and he's pedaling his heart out, and inevitably the pack catches up to him. But occasionally they don't. And Powell is kind of playing that game. He's assuming that that guy that breaks out is inflation. But eventually, that, that guy's going to burn out, and the pack, if you will, will catch up. That's the transitory nature. But what happens if it doesn't? Does the Fed have to react strongly? I think it will need to react in that scenario. But I would take issue with the, uh, the notion of strongly. We're at incredibly low interest rates, incredibly high valuations for all assets. Put differently, we have incredibly easy financial conditions. So for the real economy, he can lean against financial conditions and Wall Street will cry pain. But the economy is fundamentally very strong and not as sensitive now in a post-COVID world to the financial markets as it was prior, because we have fiscal policy supporting the economy now. So I think it's risk management. I think it's prudent. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to be cautious about the risk here uh, going forward uh, in the financial markets because it's not as clean. Thank you for joining us. And, you know, I, I think what you're saying is the financial markets and Powell would like the financial markets to fully discount uh, tapering before we actually get there. And I, I think you noted, uh, unlike 2013, it seems to me, however, that despite acting somewhat hawkish, uh, you know, a month ago at, at the Fed meeting, that he's actually done everything he could to backtrack off of that stance that I thought was getting us to that guidance. Can you can you, you know, analyze that? You know, Tim, I think we lost Paul for a second there, so I'm not going to answer your question oh. as well. Maybe Karen or Dan could jump in. We're, <laughs> waiting, we're waiting to get Paul McCulley back. Certainly when we have him, you can re-ask it, or maybe he can hear us and we can't hear him. Uh, who knows, Karen? I mean, I think that's the big bet that we're all placing right now. When I say we, I mean market investors. What's the Fed going to do longer term if inflation does not cool off? Is there a taper tantrum? Is there a rapid rise in 10-year yields based on Dan's charts? And if so, what does that do to technology, which, as we know, loves low rates? 
is that to me? Yes. Uh, so just to pick up on your cyclist analogy, maybe the guy who sprints out to the head of the pack is doping and he's got the ability to stay there. It's not natural, but <laughs> maybe that, that exists just to further the analogy. But I think I break it down tech into two parts. I think of the Google, the value, you know, the F MAGA complex uh, is much more value than the, you know, the IGV stocks, the Zoom, the CrowdStrike, the Salesforce, you know, Palantir, um, Snowflake, those kind of names. So I think those are far more sensitive to rates. Yep. So I'm more comfortable sticking with the F MAGA. Well, maybe the doping is just artificially low rates for a long time. Sven Henrik and others might argue that. Tim, we got Paul back. I don't know if he asked, heard your question, so why don't you just re-ask it again? I will tee it up again, Paul. And, and, and so mm -hmm. I, I think your view is that Powell wants to guide financial markets, which you're talking about. That's you know where the concern is, that, that on tapering well before he actually has to do it. Uh, and this would be unlike what happened in 2013. I, I feel like Powell actually went out there and was hawkish on the Fed meeting a month ago and has done everything he can to reverse off of that stance. Why, why is he trying to sound more dovish, it seems to me, after establishing the beginning of that trend you're looking for? I think he's established they're going to be tapering by the end of this year. And they're going to be making the announcement, you know, probably at Jackson Hole or sometime around that time. Uh, and then they will start it in the first part of the year. I think he wants the exact opposite of what happened in 2013 because he was kind of on the wrong side of that trade. And he wants the market to have fully discounted tapering before it starts. And I think he started that process with the last FOMC meeting, uh, and the market has been incredibly friendly since then. Uh, so he wants tapering when it happens to be a non-event. If he wanted to lean against this economy, uh, it wouldn't be with respect to tapering. It would be uh, raising more questions, if you will, about the transitory inflation thesis. And he categorically was not doing that. So I separate the whole issue of tapering, which I think he's got a great handle on. And the market has fully discounted it's going to happen six months or so from now. And the real issue is on the inflation side of things. Uh, so I, I think you need to look at them uh, in, in two different uh, 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 ways. I think it's well said, Paul, and we'll leave it there. I think that Chairman Powell wants to be the most boring man in the room. And with regards to a Fed chair, maybe that's a good thing. Boring, but important. Paul McCulley, always a pleasure, our friend. Thank you very much. You know, Dan, let's, let's trade this. Listen, I think Paul brings up a good point. 2013, let's not forget what happened. Ben Bernanke just basically came out and said, we're going to start cutting our bond purchases. That caused the taper tantrum that our long-term viewers remember very well. The stock market didn't react a lot, but bond yields did. I think to Paul's point, tell us if you agree or disagree, uh, he is trying to beat us over the head so much with this that when it finally occurs, no one's even going to blink. Can he pull that off? Well, I think what Tim was trying to get at was that the, the Fed chair has been clear as mud, if you will, over the last couple of months here. It, it hasn't actually been that clear that they are going to taper in Q4, and it's not clear to me that that's at all discounted. Now, you could say um, if that was the case, then then maybe rates are where they should be if it's discounted. Um, but I, I, I go back to, you know, when we started tapering in 14 or 15 or whatever, it just took a long time for those numbers to come down dramatically, and it came a long time um, that we got off a of ZERP. So um, I think there's going to continue to be fits and starts here. I will just say this, the fear that, you know, this this uh, medically induced coma, as, as Paul just mentioned, that we had over the last year, the fact that we think that there's just going to be these inherent um, the inflation that's just going to stick. And so I just don't understand where the last 20 years that there's any evidence that that's going to happen. And I go back to what Guy started out saying by the deflationary factors um, that, that have been in play because of technology. So seeping into every industry. So I just suspect that in a year or so, we're going to have these supply constraints and these bottlenecks, as Jay Powell calls them, fixed. And we're going to get back to worrying about inflation not being high enough.
Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.